Um, so what we're going to do tonight is uh, this is part of our campaign to protect and strengthen uh, pub our public hospitals. Uh, it's from the Ontario Health Coalition and we're a province wide organization uh, committed to uh, preserving and expanding our public health care system. Uh, we have about 400 groups that belong um, and lots of individuals. I'm sure some of you do too. And um, I'm Ross Sutherland. I chair the, the coalition. I'm a, a retired registered nurse and just recently retired from the Township Council in the, our rural community of South Frontenac, north of Kingston. And with me is uh, Riley Saunders, who's the Health Coalition's Director of Campaigns and Communication, and Grace Pierreus, a registered nurse who works in Hamilton in the Emergency Department and a Vice President of the Ola Local. Um, we're actually happy to be back here. I don't know. I, I was I was not involved in uh, St. Mary's at the time, but I was on the board, so I did follow the campaign we had about ten years ago. There was quite a fight uh, around your emergency department. Um, we worked with people like Gail Beatty, who we were hoping could be here, but it's not feeling well. Um, you know, and it was a successful campaign, but that always raises concern concerns for me when somebody's tried to get rid of your emergency once, then, uh, you know, it's worth being cautious going into the future. Um, and we've wrapped up this province-wide campaign because this is one of many town halls that we're holding because the Ford government has a very aggressive agenda to cut back on the public health care system in favor of shifting work to for-profit companies. Um, the government has brought in legislation that deepens the chaos in home care, uh, leaving uh, who's in charge completely unknown, actually. I mean, people who are working there don't know who their bosses are going to be. It's it's the strangest situation. And it's threatening to privatize the system's patient coordination services and quality oversight. We've all seen the serious negative life-threatening effects of privatization and long-term care from when we uh, the government privatized most of the homes 30 years ago. And the current government is, is ignoring the worst homes in this crisis, the ones that killed the most people, and they're extending their contracts for 30 years. The Ford government passed Bill 7 uh, to force elderly people and people with disabilities out of hospitals and override the right to inform consent rather than take measures to restore lost staff beds, operating room, and other capacity. Uh, and they've absolutely refused, been intransigent on Bill 124, which is the 1% wage freeze bill. You may have heard today that uh, uh, it was found to be unconstitutional. Um, but they are now saying they're going to appeal that. And uh, by refusing to withdraw it uh, in the face of the worst, worsening staff crisis, uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, a fork in the eye of people who work in the healthcare sector. You know, and finally, unbelievably, the government is denying that there's a staffing and funding crisis in healthcare. Um, hospitals and emergency departments across the province uh, are at risk, particularly in smaller communities. In the past summer, you know, in St. Mary's and in many other hospitals in the province, emergency departments, ICUs had to close beds, birthing units had to close, and this is really unprecedented on the scale that we've seen. Since the summer, there's been 100 temporary emergency department closures uh, in Ontario. <clears throat> At the same time, every large hospital is running at close to or over 100% capacity, some of them up to 120%. And what this means is that every bed in the hospital is full. And a hospital should really be running, if it's, if it's a well-run system, at about 85%. So that you've got surge capacity at any point in time in case you have a bad accident or a natural emergency or, you know, a pandemic, you know, heaven forbid again. You know, you should be running about 85%. But these beds, we're now running at 100%. And we've been doing that in the 95 to 100% for years, even before we got to the pandemic. And these backed up emergency departments, then back up to the ambulances, where paramedics have to wait for hours because there are no staff to offload their patients. And then there's a shortage of ambulances. And in smaller rural communities, I'd like to know if it's in yours too, um, you get a, a, a no ambulance response time because all the ambulances are tied up in larger communities. In our community of South Frontenac, we've seen a significant increase in the volunteer fire and rescue service responding to medical emergencies because there's no ambulance that can respond within 15 minutes. 
And I'm sure that this is the case in many other towns around the province. And then recently, uh, pediatric hospitals have been thrown into the crisis with children now being redirected to adult ICUs. So we're holding these town halls across the province to recognize the threats that are currently existing, find out more about what's happening locally and prepare to defend hospitals and hospital services as they uh, become uh, come under attack. And we've worked in the past with local communities and saved emergency departments in Wallaceburg, St. Joseph Island, St. Mary's and others, saved birthing units in Midland and Leamington and others, uh, stopped the closures of hospitals in Port Coburn and Fort Erie, stopped the closure of th thoracic surgeries in Windsor and won the reopening of hospital beds in Windsor and Cornwall. Um, and every time the government has undertaken it to a broad privatization agenda, we've actually been able to stop them in the last 20 years. And so far, the town halls have been very well attended with communities rallying to protect their local services and change the provincial direction. Um, because I think it's simple that this is truly an unprecedented uh, crisis in our hospital. And we were talking before we started the meeting about unprecedented you know, it, it, it almost doesn't seem to do justice to the situation. It's so far from normal. And, you know, we have to say that it is completely unacceptable. We cannot accept this the way it is. Uh, healthcare is a right and it's an, an essential service. And it's also important to recognize that this crisis has been a long time in the making. Um, for years before the pandemic, the Ontario Health Coalition and many other organizations have been warning about a looming staff crisis, a shortage of beds and the problems with private delivery of services. And Riley's going to bring up a, a chart on beds. Um, and if you look at this chart that he shared there, you can see that in Canada, Ontario has the lowest number of beds per 1000 people, a full bed less per 1,000 people than in the average. And to make matters worse, Canada is the third worst country of all the OECD countries as the developed economies in terms of the number of beds per person. So in one sense, we are the lowest of the low, um, which is not a, a really a, a title that I think we should have. Um, the other, fund, it's funding. I can't see my, my, my notes now there. You get your, your funding up there, Riley. And the situation is similar in terms of funding. When you look at uh, the funding, this is the percentage of, of GDP. Um, we're the lowest funded province in Canada for all of healthcare or for, ho for hospital funding. And this goes a long way to explaining why we've got a problem. I mean, everybody everywhere suffered during the pandemic, but in Ontario, um, we had the worst of the worst in terms of funding. And this is on purpose to force hospitals to downsize and ration their services. It's particularly a problem in smaller hospitals that have lost services as governments have forced downsizing. Local services have been cut and closed and centralized to other larger hospitals or rationed across multiple sites. Patients now have to drive from one hospital for, for rehabilitation to another one across the county for palliative care, to a different one for birthing or surgeries or tests, et cetera. Another way to look at the problem is that for the past 40 years, we have seen expanded privatization in all sectors of healthcare. And for the past 40 years, we've seen a steady erosion of healthcare until really the pandemic pushed services and staff off the cliff. And I think that explains where we are now. It's a mixture of a healthcare crisis with 40 years of deteriorating structure in healthcare. And what is staggering to the Health Coalition is how little the provincial government is doing to resolve the crisis. Um, you know, around the world, there was a terrible staff, a toll taken on hospital staff uh, in Ontario was extreme. But to make matters worse, in the budget this year, there is a a small but real cut in actual dollars to hospitals. It's not just a, a raise in hospital funding below the rate of inflation, it's an actual dollar cut to the hospital budgets in the coming year. And this is a choice that the Ford government is making to underfund health, the healthcare system. 
when the Ford government says that money won't make a difference, this is totally untrue. Well, money is not the only needed solution. I know it's, it's sort of funny when they say that. You know, it's not the only thing that we need to do to improve our health care. But almost all the needed changes can't happen without increased funds just because we are so low. Instead, their plan is to privatize the hospitals and shift resources to for-profit companies. Leading into the election, uh, we warned based on written pandemic plans from the government and the health ministry that they were planning to privatize the surgeries and diagnostics of our local hospitals. The government denied this up and down. However, at the same time, now that we've got the financial records, we found that in the first, in the three months before the election, they actually doubled funding to the private for-profit clinics. And then two months after the election in the middle of summer, they announced plans for privatization, which is part of what we're, why we're doing this tour too. For places like St. Mary's, this plan would further take scarce funds and resources away from local public hospitals and shift them to for-profit clinics. And most of these clinics, when you look at where they've got in, in Canada and around the world, they locate in large urban centers where there's a market of wealthy people for whom they can take extra, extra, extra money and make more of a profit. In St. Mary's as other communities, these local hospitals and services have been built up by the community over a hundred years. I was actually looking today when I was doing a little just sort of newspaper thing at somebody auctioning a picture of your hospital in 1950. So I don't know when it was built, but it was up and functioning and people were taking pictures of it in 1950. Um, these hospitals, people have donated to them. It has been given money from local taxes, donated through payroll deductions, volunteered, and literally built their public hospitals as an essential and vital part of their communities. And Ford's plans will dismantle these. Privatizing our public hospitals and failing to address the staffing crisis are twin issues. We are asking people to help pour pressure on the government to act with urgency that this situation demands, to support our local hospitals and stop closures and stop privatizing them. We're very worried. A hospital without an emergency department is not a hospital. It becomes an urgent care center, and these don't exist in legislation. In fact, it's just a fancy name for a walk-in clinic. So now I'd like to turn this the, the speaker over to uh, Grace. Um, like I said, is a registered nurse who works in emergency, and uh, she can talk about staffing crisis and what's happening in Southern Ontario and other comments. And then we'll get comments from you, and then Riley will talk about some things that are happening in the provincial campaign. Okay, Grace. Thanks, Russ. And um, I want to thank the Ontario Health Coalition. I mean, fantastic organization. I just love anything that brings a bunch of people together. I'm going to kind of go off script um, because I know I could ramble on about things. It just looks like an off script group of people. And just also want to, everyone to unmute themselves so you can laugh at all my jokes so I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ross. Anyway. Um, I'll laugh. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just give a couple facts off this sheet that I, you know, was prepared. So again, when uh, Ross mentioned Lois of the Low in Hamilton, uh, Hamilton on Ontario, um, 830 nurses per 100,000 people. Also the lowest, I don't have a comparison chart, but I know that it's way below. We're about 25,000 nurses short now. And this is for so many reasons. I mean, it's not, it doesn't take rocket science to say, you know, Bill 124, when people had a choice whether or not to go into the profession in the last few years, all they had to do was turn on the news. It, it's just such a I don't know how many of you work in, in hospitals that are in this group, um, but you know what it's like. You turn on the news, you know what it's like. You hear legislation, wage restraint legislation. We've got pandemics. It's just coming from all sides on top of a predicted retirement bolus, right? I, I mean, we all knew there would be this big retirement and it's hitting right now. So that's not <clears throat> super surprising. The thing I want to say the most though, um, is that counter to what Doug Ford thinks is that if, if we can look at the QP situation recently where there was a lot of public support and people gathering, it's that pressure works. And I'm an optimist. And I really think that, you know, groups like this, 
and just collective action, it works. And I'm going to guarantee you, everyone on this call, that ONA and the nurses of Ontario, all 68,000 of us, plus about 20,000 nursing students, are committed to fighting for public care. Um, on that note, on a personal note, I worked in the United States for eight years when I got out of school. So I worked for private hospitals and clinics, and I worked in the, you know, they called them the county hospitals. Um, I saw firsthand what it was like for people to make life and death decisions based on the bottom line of their bank account. Um, I still think about it. I mean, there's no question that that's exactly why I'm involved in unionism and being trying to protect our system. Um, and we voted, I think, did anybody watch that show, The Greatest Canadian? I mean, we voted Tommy Douglas as our greatest Canadian, you know, the father of our of our public system here. So I know it's near and dear to everybody and I'm preaching to a choir, um, but mainly I just wanna say that, you know, we're, gonna, we're not gonna stop fighting for the system as nurses, as part of it. Um, we're resilient and resourceful and there's a lot of us. So I think it's really popular to be part of this movement right now as well. My daughter who's a teenager tells me it's cool to be in a union and cool to stand for things now, just watching the, the action that QP took and, and watching Doug Ford turn on his heels. So I think once we keep this pressure going, I think we're gonna be successful as we have been in the past with the Ontario Health Coalition. And, um, you know, Bill 124 was found unconstitutional. He's going to fight us in court. It's another bad look. And I think we're just going to keep, we're not going to let this happen to our system, basically. Um, we're not going to let him dis dismantle and sell this to his buddies like he is the green belt. I think it's just another cause, but it's galvanizing groups like us. And um, I'm just happy to be a part of this. And, you know, as a nurse, I've got your back in the hospital and outside of it. So, that's about all I have to say, to be honest. And <laughs> thank you for giving me a moment to speak my piece. Thanks very much, Grace. Appreciate that. I'd love to open up the floor, the mics here now. Um, before we do that, though, if you don't mind, is there any press on? I heard there might be some media here. We usually just allow any media that comes on to ask questions first, but maybe not. Okay, that's fine. Um, now, I don't know how many people ha have been on Zoom and are familiar with the raise hand function. If you go to the bottom of your screen at reactions and you click on reactions, there's a thing called raise hand. If you click that, I will recognize you. Um, if you can't get that going, just wave your hand and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you or, or, or unmute and we'll um, go from there. So I, I'd love to know what's going on in St. Mary's. Um, and I'd just like to know what questions and comments you have. Okay, Sue Fowler. Uh, I just, I have a question for Grace. When you mentioned Grace, 850,000 nurses per 100,000 people in Ontario. Can you just clarify, is that registered nurses? Is it RPNs? How do you RNs. determine nurses? Yeah. Sorry, 830 R RNs per 100. Oh, sorry, let me, let me cross that. That's 830 RNs per 100,000 people in Canada. In Canada, Six, 668 RNs for 100,000 in Ontario. Thank you. Yeah. And I just, did you have something else there, Sue? Is that what you want? No, I just, no, not at okay. this time. Yeah. And I just want to stress the, the figure that, that um, Grace said there, that that comes out to 25,000 nurses RNs, you know, and at best, the government's been talking about creating four or 5,000 nurses, and we don't really see any action on that, as if that's going to solve the problem. And that's not even counting PSWs and other people who are needed in hospitals to make it work. Yeah. yeah. Elizabeth? Li Liasa? Exactly. Like close? Like close. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, my name is Elizabeth. I'm the vice president with the OPSU Local 169. And so I just wanted to express solidarity with Ona. Um, you know, OPSU is very much um, wanting to fight this fight as well uh, from my involvement with them over the last month. And uh, it's not just ONA that's facing staffing shortages, it's, it's OPSU as well, like your imaging staff, your lab staff, the staff that are helping people uh, recover after a long illness, OTPT, 
Um, so Opsu is fighting that fight as well, solidarity. Yeah. No, and, and I would just sort of stress that point, Elizabeth, that, um, you know, during during the whole pandemic, we had such a crisis in our labs because we didn't have enough lab techs. And, uh, and it's certainly not just there, it's in diagnostics and everything. It, you know, the crucial parts to a hospital, you know, 80% yeah. of, of medical decisions are made by lab results. So and involve lab results, I should say. Yeah, you know, we're so not they, graduating they, enough MLTs right now to fill the yeah. need across the province. So. And that's the same with everywhere. And and that's part of, um, if I can just go a little bit, uh, talk just a bit more here. That's part of the problem. I mean, there are some really short things the government could do to, to help a lot. Um, and then there are some things that should have been done before, but just really have to be done now. You know, where they should be working with the, with the licensing bodies, they should be working with the federal government, uh, working with educational institutions, and we need a real serious staffing strategy so that we start bringing people on as quickly as possible. Um, and in the short term, we just, you know, maybe Grace can talk more about this, what would help in the short term, but it's, we need some more flexibility in the hospitals. We need sort of an openness to bringing nurses back who've left, to keeping nurses who want to leave, to people who've retired, getting them back in. You know, we could set up a, a public temporary nurse agency, which would save hospitals a lot of money and allow many more people to work. There are things that could be done both in the short and the long term. And unfortunately, we see no action on any of them. Did you have a, anything you want to say, Chris? Sorry, I'm not going uh, to put you on the spot, but. Well, no, not at all. Gosh, this is my wheelhouse. I mean, we talk constantly at the hospital level with administration about how do we retain people? I mean, we, there's a lot of talk about recruitment, recruitment. We have a pool of really good nurses, like, right now but they're leaving they're going away like i know people that have literally opened up a dog walking business rather than work in the department that they're currently in so we've got to start with conditions right and so whatever you can do in that way we've, we've floated ideas like giving part-timers benefits um you know casual that's a huge issue out in your area um the emergency department isn't allowing enough casual nurses some people just want to be on call every now and then but if that's a difference between keeping a department open or closed I don't understand the reluctance sometimes at the at the hospital level, the employer level. The, uh, there's such resistance, and maybe somebody on this on this Zoom knows about that more personally. But I know that they have using casual. Yeah. So, um, there's a lot of strategies, but you you know you got to you got to pay people. Um, that hasn't been done in the last while. Uh, you got to make it attractive. Um, you have to make it something that's respected. Um, and then just even like it's even the wage numbers aside, it's just a disrespect of having your your rights taken that you cannot freely negotiate a contract. That's just makes you feel undervalued. And that word's been tossed around a lot in my profession. But anyway, a lot of things you could do. A lot of things the yeah. employer could do even. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. I will say too that Ona is meeting with your hospital corporation, I believe. I'm pretty sure. Uh, to actually talk about uh, using ways to get them to use more casuals in the emergency departments to help keep them open. Peter, there's a few hands up here. Peter, then John. Yeah, thanks, Ross. Uh, I'm Peter Bergmanis. I'm the co-chair of the London Health Coalition here, and it's pretty disturbing to me to keep hearing that uh, we've got eMERGE departments and de facto hospitals basically closing around London it's a tertiary center. So it's gonna be faced with, we're even more gross overcrowding than we already have. And that's a real level of crisis that, you know, if Ontarians don't grasp this, we've already got London Health Sciences Center, which is one of the most overcrowded hospitals in the country. And where are these patients gonna go once we lose even the smaller centers outside of us? Uh, we have to deal with this quite clearly. and. Um, the London Health Coalition is more than happy and willing to help St. Mary's citizens to fight back. So uh, I, I strongly encourage you to connect with uh, Ross here and myself. And uh, we, uh, we do want to organize a lot more coming into the next year. So uh, feel free. Um, but yeah, this, this cannot stand and uh, we're total allies of all of you. Great. Thanks, Peter. I just want to say too, if someone doesn't feel comfortable talking, um, by all means, write a note in the chat. 
Um, we monitor the chat. Well, I'm happy to read your question and we'll try and answer it or comment and we'll try and answer as best as we can. John Bell. OK, I guess my question is um, for Grace, mostly and it's around recruitment and you spoke a lot about the troubles you're having with recruitment of um, nurses and healthcare workers. So is it still a prerequisite or a requirement, a mandatory requirement that um, healthcare workers be vaccinated for COVID? Great and if so, question. I guess my question is, my question is kind of like, if so, why? Because um, we've already, I mean, we've learned a lot the last two years and um, I think they've now pretty much stated that uh, it won't stop transmission anyway. So I guess my question is, are we are we still sticking to that or are we allowing people back or are we taking newcomers who are not vaccinated? So that's a really great question, John. And again, it's something we've dealt with over the last year it pretty intensely. Um, Ona has always stood for that, you know, we recommend the vaccine. We're never going to not recommend. However, we are not in support of of any of our nurses losing their job over it, especially during the crisis. Um, there were ways to mitigate any sort of spread at the time, proper PPE, you know, social distancing, other things, right? So I won't mention my employer, um, but we we fired, um, not, we fought it the whole way, um, but uh, I think it was about 30 RNs. That's massive. Like you think 30, that's that's a couple medical units. That's a, a, a whole two emergency departments, you know, like that's a lot. Um, yeah, so they lost their job. We still recommend at every hospital association committee meeting that we could minimize some of our staffing losses by rehiring um, and implementing these other measures to, you know, obviously keep public safety in mind regards to spread. But you're right, the science changed. Um, but most employers did not change their policies according to the changing science. So yeah. that is, in our opinion, an untapped resource of nurses. Cheryl? Herbie? Hi there, thanks very much. I, uh, I'm losing my voice, so if I, if I go missing, I'll try to put my uh, question on a on the screen, um, I, I hear you, and and I uh, I represented a different industry at a national level, and and this is just a deep problem across the country for every industry. And we, you know, one thing that I believe is it's got to be a multi pronged uh, approach to getting people back. So some of the things you've spoken about. But I wonder about immigration and people that are doctors and nurses and all of those. Is there any lobbying taking place that um, looks at that, the qualifications? Because it's been my experience with veterinarians and, and other professionals that have got qualifications similar to Canada and have just, you know, just not been able to practice. So I'm just wondering if there is lobbying in that area. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, it's it's a huge issue in Canada. It's actually been a huge issue for a long time, not just for nurses, but for doctors and for all health professionals. And it's a very complicated one. Uh, to a certain extent, um, I'm much more familiar with the doctor situation. I think that some of the medical associations have actually actively worked against bringing in um, more doctors because it's a way of boosting their, at least historically anyway, of, of keeping sort of tight control of the market, increasing wages. It's sort of that simple. I think that right now there's definitely a move on to change that. Um, but it's there is there's certainly resistance. Uh, nonetheless, I think that public policy right now is changing and they're trying to figure out ways to get people registered in Canada quickly, uh, get them if needed uh, up to up to snuff and um, get them licensed because there are tons of good health professionals from all over the world uh, who can work here if they wish and um, it, it would it would help yeah. oh thanks very much for that I because I know the problem isn't going away like they're forecasting until you know like another 10 years of this or so right yeah. shorting stuff so yeah that's right Craig Sudi, you've got your hand up still is that because you want to say something or is it just 
No, the, the oh, sorry. Go, uh, no, no, it's okay, Craig. Go ahead. Yeah. Alrighty. Um, I'm Craig. I'm in Belleville, Ontario, and oh. uh, our family has been involved in these things, I guess, across on Ontario because we live in different places and have different time things. But when I heard you, Ross, earlier saying that um, it's the government that needs to get coordinated with their different uh, ministries and things like that, so that they can come to education and mm -hmm. health care and da 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 I think it's also important, and, it, it, and maybe you could tell me how much of this is going on, that the activists uh, get together. Now, I know you've got the nurses, and I've gone, uh, you've got your, um, I think it was Elizabeth who came in and said she's from a union and so on. But mm -hmm. I think one group going to the government is helpful and uh, willing to help out in any way there. It's also nice if heads of different organizations show up as a team and mm -hmm. uh, expand the numbers. Is any like anything like that on the horizon? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that we're there already. Um, and that's part of what's happening in these meetings. If, if uh, you know, if you would attend at all of them, I think we've had about 10 now so far, and we'll have some more after Christmas. Uh, we've had uh, senior staff or heads of unions or heads of locals, uh, I think from all of the major healthcare unions already speak. So it's this is the beginning of a campaign, and I think we'll see that kind of coordination. We're also seeing doctors and academics and uh, community organizers uh, from everything from the you know Council of Canadians to people with disabilities and older mm -hmm. women's network uh, being involved. Um, and that's what the Health Coalition has built over the last basically since '95 uh, when we started in a serious way. So, you know, that, that front is there. Um, and I think on this particular issue, there's a lot of agreement on that. Well, that's terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Riley, do you want to talk a bit about um, the campaign? That's uh, what, what we're asking people to do. Uh, and then we can maybe come back. Ross, and, yeah. Where are we here? Sorry, oh, I do oh, sorry, another, it's okay. Sue. I do have another yeah. question and then I'll put my hand down this time. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm here as a consumer. Uh -huh. um, so I'm not completely familiar with the ins and outs of uh, hospital operations and administration. Right, right. And I'm just curious, what, why are the, can you explain why the admins are resistant to hiring casual RNs to working the schedules more to fit these kind of people in that might bring some of our RNs back that don't want to work full time anymore or deal with juggling <laughs> these crazy schedules? Do you want to take that, Grace? I mean, I can, I can talk about it, but... But yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know, Sue. Like, I, I, we ask ourselves that question all the time. I think, to me, it seems like such a simple solution. There's very little obligation on the employer's part, except for having to manage and keep track of their commitment availability. I mean, it... I'm not sure. I Maybe it didn't feel like, at the time, so just to give you a little information about like collective agreements and I'll just keep it really brief up until very recently there wasn't any commitment needed by a casual nurse you could just forever stay on the seniority list and not really have to give a lot of give any availability and the manager would have to follow up with you and, and you know make sure your education was up to date and it seemed like more trouble than it was worth there was a, a, not much interest in casual work for a very long time however that has changed like huge so it's just a matter of changing the mentality of management that you can implement in your local contract a certain amount of um, availability that's mandatory like one shift every four weeks whatever it might be just negotiate that into your language and then you've got commitment and then they can pick up extra you know but I'm not sure I think it's just old habits die hard unless for us you have another great reason why it's a there's a reluctance well, I think there's two things that come to my mind. One of them is you sort of hinted at it there. There is an extra cost and burden on hospitals. As a matter of fact, they would, just because you got to keep track of them, you have to make sure they're trained. You got to, there's all that sort of obligation that goes along um, with, and that, but that's why I think hospitals are prepared to use temporary agencies more than keep their own staff on. And the thing about temporary agencies that people don't know is that the cost per hour for a temporary nurse is somewhere between $150 and $180 an hour, I think. I think that's what we're talking about. 
uh, you know, you've got a, a temporary, uh, you know, a nurse that you have on staff and you're looking at including benefits in the whole works, maybe what, 60, Grace, you know, 60, $70 an hour now? I don't know. It's been a few years since I was in emergency. Yeah, but... no, top wage isn't even, yeah, no. It's... Yeah. So, you know, the, the, you know they're, they're willing to pay $100 more an hour to use a temporary agency which takes care of that kind of stuff than they are themselves. But I think the second reason, and I, and I, and I say this without really having any proof, except I'm pretty sure it's true, is that um, hospital boards, um, you know, they're, they're an independent organization. They're independent from the government. Um, but at the same time, they're very, very dependent on the government. You know, they're really... They're, they're independent corporations, so technically they can do what they want, but we had a, a CEO of the hospital corporation in Kingston try that, and it didn't take long before he didn't have a job. Um, and I think when the government is saying to hospital corporations, well, you know, we're not really giving you that much money, and we're, we're, you know, we're really sort of looking at trying to find services that we can move out, or, you know, we want to have more... Uh, chronic care beds in your hospital or more, you know, rehab beds, then the CAOs, that's what they look for. And they don't think in sort of imaginative ways about how to make their, their public health system work because that's not the direction they're getting from the Ministry of Health. Uh, so that's a political problem. And um, I think it's just a very real political problem. You know, they're, if, the, if the Ministry of Health said to people, we want First off, and I think if you were going to talk to your M your MPP, by the way, uh, at any point in time, what you want to get from them is a commitment that the hospital and the emergency will stay open, like a public commitment. You want that from the ministry. And if they made that commitment, then the CAO would go out of their way, presumably, if they're doing their job, to figure out how to keep it open. And the problem is we don't necessarily have, well, we don't have that commitment. I mean, it's not necessarily, we don't have it. So they have to change the thinking rather than looking at how do we maybe give some of this work to, you know, these private companies to try and free up beds or how do we move the, these alternative long care, term care, you know, patients, the sort of bed blockers is what they call it, which is a terrible insulting name. Um, how do we pin it on them and move them out, um, you know, to places they don't want to be? You know, that, that's not the kind of solution they should be looking at. They should be looking at how do we make this hospital work and how do we keep the emergency open? And then when you start to think about that as, as the goal, then you come up with ways of using casual staff, of retaining people. You come up with, you know, asks for a certain kind of money. You know, London has has recently opened a, you know, this is a big city solution, but it's um, one that's been used in Toronto too, and it's not unknown. You know, the hospital there has built a um, a uh, an outpatient clinic, which is part of the hospital. It's part of the public health care system to streamline certain kinds of simple surgeries. Uh, so it's a public it's a public sector solution to the problem. And you know, I'm I, I'm not asking Peter to talk about it. But I'm just saying there are solutions out there if people think about them and they make that the priority. I wish I had a better, clearer answer. There you go. Riley, do you want to just uh, give us a little update on what, what we're doing provincially and then we can come back to general comments? Yeah, um, so I'm just going to take you guys through some of the provincial campaign and what we're building and moving towards. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen so I can show you guys can see where you can find some of these resources. Um, obviously, some of these things, uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to build in St. Mary's. Um, and in the smaller communities. Uh, but what you can do right away to help build it is if you go to ontariohealthcoalition.ca, so that's our uh, website here, and I'll put it in the chat after I'm done sharing my screen, uh, it will come right to our homepage, and you'll see at the top here a bit of a slideshow with some recent events. If you scroll down, there'll be a sign-up sheet here. And this may look like a sign-up sheet for like a petition or for a membership, but it really isn't. Um, we're not using this information for that we're collecting for anything like that. Instead, what we're doing is we're trying to get this count up as high as possible. So we just went live a few days ago when we started these town halls and we haven't really sent them out yet. And what we're trying to do is get this number up to like a million. If we can get this up to a million, we need to 
make a strong message to Doug Ford to let him know that Ontarians do not support this, that he does not have a mandate to privatize our health care and to continue to do nothing while our hospitals close. So what we really need to do is make this cost really, really apparent to him that if he does this, he will face the political cost of doing this. Um, so if you sign up here, if you do want to get more information about the campaign, you can click yes, in which case we'll keep you updated. Uh, but if you just want to help us get to that number and don't really want to, that's totally okay too, and you can hit no. Uh, and then we won't use your information for anything at all, uh, and you won't hear from us. Um, when you do sign up, you will get an email uh, with some resources in it about things that you can do, and that would be the only email you'll get um, right away. Um, but what we're asking for people to do in communities like St. Mary's and across Ontario is we're asking you to hand out uh, leaflets or put them up in your workplaces, uh, put them up in your faith groups or churches, uh, anywhere that you have a large amount of people where you can start talking about it. Um, so I'll show you if you click here, um, it will bring you to this page, which will have all the resources. Uh, so if you click onto the leaflet, you can print it directly from here. It has the information about what the threat of privatization is, what you can do to stop it, where you can get inform more information. Um, so you would just print it and then fold it along the dotted lines and then put it up anywhere that uh, there's public there. The second campaign we're working on, uh, it's going to take a little bit of explaining, uh, but it's actually already been done in, I think it's Alberta. Um, and that is uh, what we can do is, as we all know, uh, the Canada Health Act prevents uh, governments from charging people in Canada for medically necessary services. That, however, is violated all the time uh, in independent health facilities and private clinics. For example, cataract surgeries uh, might charge people up to, we've heard recently, up to um, 7,000 people, um, or sorry, $7,000 uh, for cataract surgeries. Sometimes they do it in ways that are really sneaky. They might uh, ask you for like an enhanced lens or they might charge you for extra measurements that are not necessary uh, for the surgery. The same thing, they might do that at endoscopy clinics where they uh, might charge you to see like a dietitian or a nutritionist or something like that. Uh, these are all violations. Uh, so what we can do is if we get enough evidence of people doing this, we can do a writ of mandamus, which is calling on the government to uphold the Canada Health Act uh, and to stop them from violating this. So there's a survey here, and if you click it here, it will bring up the survey and it will just ask you information about what you were charged for, uh, who you are, any details that you can provide, and we're going to be collecting this and uh, using it to force the government to uphold the Canada Health Act. Uh, the third thing uh, that we don't have up yet uh, available, and uh, it's not, uh, we don't have anything planned yet for St. Mary's, is we are going to be holding large protests. Uh, so our first batch of protests are going to be in uh, Toronto, uh, Windsor, uh, Niagara Falls, Ottawa. Uh, there might be one in Waterloo, uh, which I think is probably the closest one to you um, that we're having so far. And there's going to be more in the New Year's. Um, so if you keep your eyes uh, posted on here, as soon as we get the details, it will be, the information will be put up here publicly. And this is what we're really trying to build for, um, is to see this kind of uh, awareness raised and to get people involved. So those are three things that you can do uh, right off the bat, uh, is to sign up, um, hand out the leaflet, put it up in your workplaces. Uh, if you know anyone who's been charged for medically necessary services, please get them to fill out and provide us with that information so that we can force the government to actually uphold the Canada Health Act. Um, so those are all pretty simple and I'll put the link uh, to our website in the chat as well. Um, and if anyone does want to, you know, take the trip out to uh, Waterloo or Toronto or Niagara Falls, or I know Craig, you said you were in Belleville, um, I think there's a bus going from Kingston to Ottawa um, or something like that. Please let us know as well. Um, we, we definitely need as much people out as possible. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Riley. And feel free to sign up now. Ontario Health Coalition, become a medical, Medicare defender. You can just click on the link in the chat. There's a, a question here from uh, on uh, temp agencies. And um, I, I, I think I've got this right. Grace can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 
When you hire temps in a private agency, often they are paid more than hospital staff. Like, so the temp agency makes a lot of money, but those nurses also make money. And that's part of how they, they attract them away from emergencies. This is part of the problem is they attract them away from being staff in hospitals by saying, we'll pay you more if you're just available all the time. And uh, yeah, so that, that is a significant problem. Um, one of the, solu the solutions that's been suggested is that we should actually have a public temp agency, which does that work for hospitals, uh, pays, you know, pays people the going rate, whatever the rates in hospitals are, and is able to provide casual staff, which um, would, would help people. Unfortunately, uh, I don't think that it's a violation of the Canada Health Act uh, to use temp agencies. Um, I wish it was, but I, I don't think that it is, unfortunately. Can you touch on the court case started on Bill 7 this week, please? You want to talk about the rally or should I? Where I don't even know where you are. It's up to you. Um, so if you guys did see uh, Bill 7, uh, the More Beds, Better Care Act, um, was rushed through legislature uh, a few, well, I guess it was a couple months ago now, wasn't it, Ross? Yeah. Um, and what that bill did was it uh, allowed the government to remove consent, the informed consent, the requirement for informed consent to force uh, patients that are in ALC beds, so alternative level of care beds, so people that are not in emergency care beds uh, or are in a different uh, level of bed than uh, what they need, it was able to force them to move into long-term care homes, uh, not of their choosing. So when you're an ALC patient right now, you're forced to choose, I think it's three, uh, three or five homes uh, that you would want to go to if you're waiting for long-term care. Uh, this uh, new bill allows them to assess you uh, for long-term care, send your application out to a long-term care home without your consent, and start the admission process for that long-term care home without your consent. And it allows them to move you to any long-term care home, even if it's not one of the ones that you've chosen. Uh, it also allows uh, you them to move you up to 75 kilometers away in southern Ontario and 150 kilometers away in northern Ontario or more. Um, so we're hearing of people being moved far away from their families where they have no access to care or um, essential caregivers. Um, so that is what's happening. And if uh, you are in a nail C bed uh, and you do not uh, consent to going to long-term care, they can charge you $400 per day uh, as a penalty uh, until you do uh, consent to go. Um, so what we've done is we've issued a charter challenge saying that this law is discriminatory against the elderly and people with disabled as it violates their rights and their uh, right to inform patient consent and the right to care. Uh, so that should be going forward very shortly um, and uh, we will be taking them to court too. Uh, get that overturned. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's going to cost us quite a bit of money. So um, if anyone is uh, able to do donate, uh, you can also donate at the OntarioHealthCoalition.ca website. Uh, there, we have a legal fund there that helps to cover our legal costs. Um, I think they're saying it's going to cost us around $500,000 um, to bring that mm -hmm. to fruition. So um, please help if you can. <laughs> yeah. And if I could just add one quick thing, you've got to think about this in the sense that we have 35,000 people waiting for long-term care in Ontario, something like that. I mean, rough figures, 30,000 people waiting for long-term care. So the hospital, the long-term care facilities that have beds right now are the facilities that nobody wants to go to. There's a reason why they have empty beds. And they're forcing people, uh, violating their rights, we think, in a very fundamental way to take lousy beds. In a way, it's sort of the worst form of privatization because these are all for-profit for profit, long-term care homes. So they're filling them up so they'll be making more money for the companies that run these homes. And the people will be getting the worst care because that's why these beds are available. Uh, it's just, you know, I mean, I think that's just the real politic on the ground with that one. Trina? Sorry, right, just took me a minute there to get off mute. I just wanted to say thank you again, Ross. Uh, thank you, Ross, for having this town hall. And um, I'm Trina Hollingworth, and we, you know, we have uh, over 500, 500 members in CUPE across uh, here in Perth Healthcare Alliance. So Stratford, Clinton, Seaforth, and St. Mary's. So we're definitely on board. We've talked to uh, Ona and Opsu, and 
We'll be uh, having meetings with the MPPs for both uh, here and in Perth County. And uh, whatever we can do, we're we're with you. So let us know, you know, what we can do to uh, to uh, to help stop the closures. Yeah. Thank well, you. Well, if you can get you get your people to sign the healthcare defenders, absolutely. That that would be great. Thank yeah. You. And any anybody else you can talk to. Yeah. What other questions do people have or comments? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Um, I don't know if you if you're interested in helping in when things come up in St. Mary's. Um, we do have your name and number, but uh, if you wanted to either send a, a message in the message box or contact myself uh, or Riley, we would be happy to get back to you and talk about what you can do. And I really would encourage you, if possible, to uh, fill in the uh, Medicare Defender. Um, become a Medicare defender so we know and we can tell people that these people are willing to defend Medicare and get your family, friends and any organizations you're involved. That's a great one to do. Um, come out to rallies if you can. Uh, write to your MPP. You write a letter to the newsletter. They all help because this is a campaign and it's a campaign that's going to be going on. Hopefully we'll get some short term victories in the next little while and, and hopefully we'll make a, a significant dent in what happens in the next election. Uh, and we'll get a, some governments or some arrangement, which is a little less hostile to uh, public health care. Yes, Craig? Uh, am I on? Um, yep. I just wondered if there is a link to the federal uh, efforts right now. Liberal government seems to be fighting the conservatives in their um, address today on TV uh, about health care and and that sort of thing. So is this all linked to federal as well? Well, we don't tend to do a lot of federal stuff. There's a Canadian Health Coalition that we are affiliated with. Okay. And, and they are more involved in that. Although, you know, with Canadian federalism, it's a, it's an odd situation for sure. I mean, I mean, I think our, our biggest input is that we support more money coming from the feds to the province, but we also think it should be tied so that it doesn't just go into to general revenue and not get spent, which is what happened during the COVID crisis. We had tons of money given to the province and uh, most of it, uh, well, not most of it, but significant chunks did not get spent. Wow. Is CARP involved? Uh, not directly, no. no. Not that I know. I, I, I guess I can't, I can't actually say that. I don't know for sure. Um, That's the Canadian um, Association of Retired People. Uh, CARP, uh, not centrally, they've centrally not involved, but we do have local chapters of CARP that are very supportive and involved. Okay. Thanks, Riley. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Joan? I want to say thank you because I was, I'm just a consumer, but have lots of concerns about our... A patient. A patient. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to say thank you for helping, and I certainly will get involved in whatever I can. That's great. Did you have any particular concerns you wanted to raise? I uh, know just in general, because, you know, it's a, it's a concern when you don't have a hospital that we worked very hard over the years to maintain. Yeah, you have, yeah. Anyway, thank you for your help. Yeah, the more you can do any of those things and be around, we appreciate that. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Ross, I just wanted to say uh, one more thing. I've gotten quite a few uh, private messages of people uh, stepping up to volunteer to help uh, push in your local community. Um, if anyone is uh, interested in volunteering, like Joan just was as well, if you could write in the chat uh, your name, I can email and connect with you tomorrow. Um, we are, it's really, really important that communities like yours get involved. Uh, those of us in the city, we feel like the Ford government knows that they don't have a chance of winning uh, in Toronto, in downtown Toronto, and therefore they don't care to hear from us. Uh, but in smaller communities like St. Mary's where you have conservative MPPs, they should care. You are their constituents. You have a lot of power to sway them. And uh, we really do need to make uh, this um, really visible and let them know what shaky ground they're on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's sort of the case in my area, which is a conservative bedrock too. And, but in, and I know that the MPP is is paying attention, you know, yeah, which is good. Joan, did you have your hand up again or no? Okay, that's no problem. 
Any other final comments? Well, thank you so much for for doing this work and leading the charge. And uh, certainly it's the first time I've been aware of this level of concern and, yeah. and even some of the legislation you're talking about. So time to get on the on the train. Great, trying to get on the train. Anyway, everybody, thank you very much for taking an hour out of your evening. And we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be we'll be in touch. This is a this is a long, this is a marathon, short run, but short sprints, but marathon too. Thanks very much, everybody.